what was the common feature of every Trump rally in 2016? Right. Lock, Pro- her lock, up. Her up. lock her right. up. Lock her up. Like, what do the, they mean by that? What What could they mean? What you know? Pi, what does that suggest about his willingness to use the power of the government? So he's been telling us this consistently. Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. It is Friday. And as you have undoubtedly noticed, the former president of the United States is spending a lot of time in court, which he will be doing over the next year. Donald Trump spent much of the week in a New York courtroom. And of course, he still faces more than 90 felony charges. And this does seem relevant to the presidential race, except, of course, if you watched uh, this week's Republican debate. Okay, so Ben Wittes, Ben Wittes, who joins me on the Trump trial. How surreal is it to watch a debate in which the fact that the former president of the United States faces um, multiple felony charges, he's been accused by the federal government of violating the Espionage Act, absconding with war documents, Uh, he's facing racketeering charges in Georgia, he is facing charges of defrauding the federal government and obstruction, and yet it barely came up during the debate. I'm sorry, I, I keep coming back to all of this, that we we need to step back and go, hey, you know, um, we're not the crazy ones. This is a bizarre moment we're living through. Yeah, I just want to say that I don't know how surreal it is, Charlie, because I made a decision Wednesday night Good decision. That I didn't need to watch the debate. These are irrelevant people. Yeah. Uh, if we had a high school debate about, you know, um, who should be president, um, you know, the yeah. ch- uh, captain of the football team versus the uh, robotics team. I wouldn't go to that debate. And this is about as important and relevant as that. Uh, I will um, f- start following the Republican primary the day that Donald Trump either drops dead or withdraws from it. Until then, show me a poll in which somebody is in within 20 points of him. Maybe I'll pay attention. But I don't know how surreal it was because I was yeah. blissfully yeah. not watching it. Well, but everything is surreal. I mean, the, the fact yes. the fact that he's he's you know gets sixty percent of the Republican vote during all of this during all of the the actual Trump trial. I mean, I think there were people who believe well when when the actual trials begin, when people actually see him, when he takes a stand, and America gets to see you know the lizard brain in full uh, blustering. So let let's just start there. Should we just start um, with? Rather remarkable moment. I know it's Friday, um, but this was this week that Donald Trump actually did something that a lot of people thought he would never do. He took the stand, um, testified under oath, and uh, put on a Trumpian performance. Uh, so give me your give me a read of of how that went. What you saw? Yeah. So it was uh, first of all uh, pretty dramatic in the sense that he. Um, you know, was uncareful. People like to say that when Trump actually testifies, he's careful with what he says. Mm -hmm. Uh, He was not careful with what he says. He uh, admitted that he basically uh, was, you know, quite aware of and quite involved in the valuation process and directed it, which is, I think, a very damaging admission for his uh, fraud defense. He also attacked the judge, which I just, you know, I'm not allowed to give anybody legal advice, strangers. When you're in front of a judge who's going to decide whether you get to, uh, you know, how much money you owe in fines and uh, don't attack the judge. It's bad. It's a bad move. Um, There are no good arguments for it. Um, And he's clearly made the judgment insofar as he's strategizing as opposed to emoting that he's already lost this case. Um, The show is more valuable for him than than any marginal value or damage that he could do to himself. And so that's I I think that's really where we are. It's not a, um, you know, He's already lost in the sense that the judge has already found uh, liability. Um, There's just sort of evaluating the scope of it now. Um, uh, You know, he's um, but I do think it is a warm up for some of the criminal cases where. But they will never uh, let him testify in those cases, will they? 
Well, so first of all, you assume it's up to them, right, as opposed well. to up to him. Um, and secondly, you assume that the the purpose is to avoid liability or conviction, mm-hmm. whereas I think Trump's purpose in the criminal cases is to win by winning the election and then making well, the cases go away. Right. And so I agree that no sane lawyer would ever let him take the stand, but that assumes that this is being run by sane lawyers rather than by Donald Trump himself. And I think he will take the stand if he thinks it is valuable for the show. Okay, I I, I, I take your point. Let's go back to um, the New York case so because we had this uh, this strange moment where the the judge uh, Judge uh, Arthur and in, in, in Gorham um, used the word beseech. I beseech you to um, control Donald Trump. Um, and then, of course, he didn't control Donald Trump. Donald Trump went on and blustered. Maybe the judge thought he would just sort of burn himself out. Give me your 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 read on whether or not the judge handled that correctly. You know, on the one hand, he's probably thinking, if if I am too harsh on him, if I hold him to the same standard I'd hold any other human being, um, I might make I will look bad. He will be he will score political points. I might be more vulnerable on appeal. On the other hand, he kind of let Donald Trump run rampant. In that court. He did. So, so um, on the other hand, um, so I, I'm quite sympathetic to the judge here. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I do not think anything in your training as a superior court judge in the city of New York quite prepares you for something like this. And so I don't think it's a. Um, you know, I, I don't think it's a question with a right and wrong answer. Yeah. Um, look, the the big problem that Judge Ngoran has here is that he we all know what he's going to do, which mm-hmm. is go, he's going to find some massive liability uh, for Trump. He's going to, um, you know, do something to dispose of his businesses that re- involves removing them from his control. and. You want to do that in a way that, it, and and you're doing that with the eyes of the entire world on you and your poor law clerk, um, and you know you want to do it in a way that minimizes uh, the possibility that you're going to be reversed on appeal and have Trump claim a huge victory as a result of it. And so right. the judgment is clearly. Uh, Let's, first of all, be a bit permissive in terms of uh, you don't want to give him the argument that I was unable to make my defense, that I was prohibited from doing X, Y, and Z. So you tolerate a certain amount of antics. Now, by the way, those antics all create a record which you're going to write an opinion. Um, And, you know, every, every one of those ignored I beseech you's. Um, becomes uh, uh, something evidence you can use in the record. And it also uh, gives Letitia James a whole lot of arguments on appeal that the court was extremely tolerant. The court allowed Trump okay. to do okay. X, that's, Y, that's and Z. Yeah. And so yeah. all it, the only problem with it is that in the very short term, it allows Trump a certain amount of theatrical. He, he got to, he got to put on the show. I mean, look. I mean, before we move on here, clearly in in Trump's lizard brain, he knows that he's lost the case. Um, he's putting on the the show for the MAGA base or for the the, the appeal. But also knowing Donald Trump um, and knowing his 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 track record, I, I wonder whether or not he actually thinks that behaving that way will browbeat and bully the judge. Because in the past, it's worked. If you, you push back, he's seen people cave in. And I wonder, you know, in, in his calculation, to the sense that the word calculation applies here at all, which it really doesn't, you know, um, he's actually thinking, you know, when I punch people and I hit them and I insult them, I watch them cave and grovel. Maybe, maybe, maybe it will work again. It won't. But it, do you think that's part of his I, thinking? You know, I don't know. Thinking, brain, yeah. His thinking is really opaque to me. Yeah. And um, I, I like to, you know, I like to think about it more as I, I can't get inside the brain. I can only predict behaviors kind of like a shark uh, or a lizard, as you would say, you know, like 
All right, I don't I mean, know lizard, what the shark, shark yeah. what the shark is experiencing when it's going toward the you know school of fishes with that menacing expression on its face and absolutely no emotional valence. I I, I can't get inside the shark's okay. head, but I do know what the behavioral result is, right? I know, and that's sort of the way I think about Trump. I don't really purport to understand what he's thinking. I'm not a clinical psychologist. Um, I do think it was very predictable that he would do this, and he did this. And I think he'll do it as much as any given judge will let him. The calculations are different in a civil case than they are in a criminal case where you um he's you know both in florida and in georgia and in washington on supervised release from pretrial detention which is relevant right yes so So i think the 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 questions are quite different and the probably the proper way to handle it for a judge may be also quite different but i do think for a two day testimony or what, you know, whatever it was in, in a civil case in New York, uh, a certain degree of tolerance okay. makes us a lot of so sense. I, I just I want to ask you about this. Just, I'm going to see if you can see this is, this is a, you're not gonna be able to read it. It's a, it's a, it's a tweet that went out a little while ago from Elise Stefanik. Okay. Elise Stefanik, who uh, has become the super mega congresswoman um, who replaced Liz Cheney in Republican leadership. She just said, I just filed an official judicial complaint against Judge Arthur N. Gorin for his inappropriate bias and judicial intemperance in New York's disgraceful lawsuit against President Donald J. Trump and the Trump Organization. Uh, Americans are sick and tired of the blatant corruption by radical leftist judges in New York. All New Yorkers must speak out against the dangerous weaponized lawfare against uh, President Trump. Read my full complaint below, and it is a complaint to the New York State Commission on Judicial Conduct, blah, 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 blah. Can I just translate this? Well, can I, before you do, I just want to announce that I have filed a, no. a House Ethics Committee complaint against mm-hmm. Elise Stefanik for, a, for cultural appropriation of the word lawfare. lawfare I was thinking which, you were going um, to do that. You know, I just want to put that on the record. That complaint has been filed. You can read the whole thing on Serious my fictitious stuff. website. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm just going to translate this into English. Um, Elise Stefanik, uh, I just filed an official complaint. No, what it should read is, I really, really want to be Donald Trump's running mate. I really, really <laughs> want to run for vice president. And it might actually work for her. Okay, before we get to um, what I thought was a rather epic uh, filing by Jack Smith's team this this week, the 79-page motion, which I kind of briefly excerpted in my, in my Morning Shots newsletter, I want to, want to take a step back to uh, Donald Trump's uh, continuing escalation of his threats to weaponize the Department of Justice uh, and the FBI. I mean, in case there's there's any ambiguity about all of this. Uh, so earlier in the week, the Washington Post had a deep dive in the way that he's basically planning a campaign of revenge that he will that he will turn the Department of Justice uh, against his political opponents and his critics, including people who had worked in his own administration, uh, talking about um, pro- perhaps prosecuting not just Mark Milley, but General John Kelly, who is his chief of staff. Their, their crime being that they said bad things about him. So Washington Post has a story. Donald Trump intends to use the Department of Justice as an as a weapon of retribution. And today he basically is confirming it. He gives this interview to Univision where he says that, uh, yes, absolutely. I'm going to weaponize it. Uh, if, if, if they you know, when they when they uh, indicted me, they basically said that I can indict you. And so um, here's a, in a piece. People think that this is taken out of context or it's a gaffe or like, oh, you guys are exaggerating this. Here is Donald Trump again describing how he is going to go after his political opponents. Listen to this. We will start by exposing every last crime committed by crooked Joe Biden, because now that he indicted me, we're allowed to look at him. Hey, back. But he did real bad things. Yeah. We will restore law and order to our communities. And I will direct a completely overhauled DOJ to investigate every Marxist prosecutor in America for their illegal, racist, and reverse enforcement of the law. 
man, he keeps telling us who he is and what he's going to do. And I think it's completely plausible. Your thoughts about this? Well, so let me say that I published my thoughts about this uh, back in May of 2016. Um, when That's Trump a little bit ahead was, of the curve. Yes, I think mm. I was the first person to flag this issue. Uh, and um, uh, I'm just going to read what I wrote at the time. Um, uh, let me be blunt. The soft spot in weaponization of the federal government is not the NSA and it's not the drone program. The soft spot, the least tyrant proof part of the government is the United States Department of Justice Jesus. and the larger law enforcement and regulatory apparatus of the United States. The first reason you should fear a Donald Trump presidency is what he would do with the ordinary enforcement functions of the federal government, not the most extraordinary ones. Um, uh, Did people think that you were being a little bit, oh, come on, Ben, it can't be that bad. We have norms. So, we have so, you know, guardrails. I wrote, this was a three-part series that I wrote in 2016 called Trump and the Powers of the American Presidency. All three parts are still on lawfare. Wow. One of them, the entire thing is about the Justice Department and about the the fact that everybody's, you know, looking for these esoteric powers that Trump could abuse. You know, would he do domestic drone strikes and what's he going to do with blah, blah, blah. And the fact is that the ordinary powers of the government are extraordinarily powerful and dangerous if they're in the hands of sociopaths. Excuse me. Mm. Um, and... So uh, um, I think at the time, uh, the people who were following, you know, follow executive power issues carefully uh, were like quite sympathetic to the argument. Mm -hmm. uh, it became obvious that it was right at the time of the Comey firing. Um, well, and I mean, it look, has I mean, even before, I mean, really, it, it's, it's one of those things where once again, it's, it's happening in broad daylight. It, it's not subtle. I mean, what, what was the common feature of every Trump rally in 2016? Right. Lock Pro her lock up. Her up. Lock her right. up. It's like, what do they but, mean by that? What, what could they mean? What, you know, Pipe, what does that suggest about his willingness to use the power of the government? So he's been telling us this consistently. Right. And here, there is only one defense against this, and it, it is a doozy, ultimately, but it's not good enough. So the one defense is that, you, look, you can say you're going to sick the Justice Department on Bill Barr, um, which, mm -hmm. by the way, would have a certain cosmic justice There's to a karma, it, karmic there. justice. A bit of karma. Um, but um, you can say that. But at the end of the day, if Bill Barr hasn't committed any crimes – the Justice Department is going, there's going to be a limit to what it can do. Uh, you know, and we saw that a little bit with John Durham, right? So John Durham could, you know, harass and ultimately indict people, but it took a jury a very short amount of time in two big cases mm -hmm. to, you know, a matter of hours, not days to acquit people, not hang, but acquit. Um, and so, you know, I do think there there is to some degree a limiting factor. Here's the problem. The problem is an investigation, fighting off a federal investigation is a big, big headache. Yeah. Most people don't have the resources to do it. You go after Bill Barr, who can spend $30,000 on a Christmas party, he's going to be fine. Yeah. You go after some mid-level, you know, a bureaucrat, that is a big problem for that person. And so I look, you know, the, the Justice Department is a, and the FBI are terrifyingly powerful institutions. And that's why we have layers and layers and layers of uh, protections, normative, legal, and uh, and bureaucratic protections against their misuse. And what Trump has been promising since you know, 2015 really is to strip those away. He did that in a substantial way in his first term. Can he do and that? He's what, what are his powers? I mean, in theory, right, as part of the executive branch, you know, these these norms and these these limits 
how vulnerable are they to a president who's figured out where the buttons and the levers are? Well, should I read to you further from my, yeah, please. From my piece in 2016? I would be honored. The Justice Department has some institutional defenses against this sort of thing, but they are far weaker than the intelligence community's in de institutional defenses against abuse. Hmm. They mostly do not reside in statute or in the sort of complex oversight structures uh, that civil libertarians complain in the case of the NSA are not restrictive mm -hmm. enough. They reside in the Levy guidelines, mm -hmm. in certain normative guidelines. rules about contacts between the Justice Department and in the White House, in norms that have developed over the years in the FBI, and they reside in the hearts of a lot of replaceable mm -hmm. people. Ultimately, the they resolve in an instant. They reside in an institutional culture at the Justice Department, and that is precisely the sort of thing a tyrant leader can change. Okay, that was not reassuring, Ben. That I, was, that, that I was have, not reassuring in any way. <clears throat> I don't think it should be reassuring. I think the, the Justice Department is, um, it works because it has a culture, and Trump is promising to change the culture. The first time Trump was elected, the day after the election, a very stressed young uh, assistant United States attorney came into my office and told me he was planning to resign. And I said, y you, this is a career person, yeah. not a political appointee. And I said, I, I don't think you should do that. Mm -hmm. You know, there we still need people to prosecute yeah. crimes. We still need. Right. And he said, yeah, Ben, but. I just can't imagine myself standing up in court and saying, I'm, insert name here, and I represent the United States when, wow. the, uh, when the federal government is run by Donald Trump. Now, I and some other people persuaded this person not to right. resign at the time. Good. Uh, but he did resign six months later mm -hmm. um, and, you know, is now a prominent professor um, and I think you will have a very significant exodus of career officials, which is, by the way, what Trump wants. Right. See, he that, wants the, dilemma. you know, the deep, he yeah. wants the deep state to, uh, be hollowed out. He wants to make them all schedule F fireable. Um, and a lot of that stuff is doable. Um, so I, you know, and I think also people's own professional interests don't lie in standing up in court see, and defending the indefensible. See, and and, and what's, what's, what's really, I think, dangerous about all of this is the people who would most likely say, I cannot work for, for Donald Trump, are A, the, the people of that culture, the people of good character, who understand the, the value of the independence. So in other words, the best um, are the ones most likely to leave. Um, if, if they're not if they're not fired, they're also likely to be the kinds of people who could walk out of the Department of Justice and actually increase their salaries someplace Bingo. else. You know, and Bingo. so this is this is very real as a possibility that Donald Trump is basically saying, I'm going to get rid of the best and the brightest and the best and the brightest may say, we're not going to even wait for you. Um, we have we have options and we are not going to stay here and be and, and, and be complicit in what you were about to do. On the other hand. Again, this is this is the ongoing debate. You know, you need those people. If you're going to preserve that culture, they have to stay. And yet the right. people who will uphold the culture are the ones most likely to be the most vulnerable and most likely to, to go to f head for the exits. Shit. Yeah. So I, th I think that's exactly right. And um, by the way, it's not something that will be visible to the public. Yeah. Because when career law enforcement resign, when career mm. as assistant United States attorneys take jobs at Covington and Burling yeah. um, or Arnold yeah, and Porter, right, 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 th right. that's the normal trajectory anyway. And right. so if, if, you know, 5,000 of them do it six to months to six years earlier than they would yeah. otherwise have done it, that is, and by the way, it happens over time, not like, instantaneously, right? Mm -hmm. So over time, you have 
a drainage mm. of such people into the jobs that they will otherwise occupy. And they do tend to go into them anyway, because as their kids get older, they have tuitions to pay and the, the, the salary differentials are immense here. And so, you know, then they go into these jobs a little bit faster or sometimes a lot faster. They apply for, um, for uh, uh, you know, teaching positions. And all of a sudden, your and by the way, the intake valves, the what the Justice Department honors program, the uh, the the program in which you staff these positions with first rate people, many fewer first rate people apply because who wants to go into, you know, the, uh, a, the, the lock her up department. Right. And so you have a, a quicker exit and a replacement with much lower quality people, and it's completely invisible to the public. Yeah, there'll, there'll be one story in the New York Times, the Washington Post, or maybe Politico uh, summing up the the exit, you know, the, the brain drain from the department. It'll be one story, and it'll be read by the usual suspects and then completely uh, memory hold uh, probably by the end of that week. Okay, so slightly better news. Um, I'm going to get your take on this as well. I actually did read that 79-page um, motion from uh, Jack Smith's team where they, they pushed back against Donald Trump's efforts to have the, uh, the January 6th election subversion case thrown out. And a couple of things struck me about this is that, and, and, and this is perhaps not new, and certainly not news to you, but Jack Smith has really learned the lesson of the previous attempts to go after Donald Trump, including the Mueller investigation. No disrespect to the Mueller investigation, but that was an asymmetric struggle between kind of an <laughs> old school guy who thought that the old rules applied versus Donald Trump, who threw every piece of shit he possibly could, obstructed, attacked, vilified. And Mueller never said anything. There was I mean, it was it was it was much quieter. Jack Smith realizes what he's in for. And I, I am struck by reading this, how forceful the filings are, how direct and clear they are. One declarative sentence marches after another. As he lays it out, as he lays out the case, details and catalogs all the lies um, so precisely uh, in, 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 you'll understand this, I, in actual comprehensible, vivid English, as opposed to right. the usual legal gobbledy, gobbledygook and, 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 and jargon. And what I really thought was interesting about the filing this week was it, it really laid out all of the, I mean, it, it ties together why Donald Trump's lies um, you know, are central to all of this. And even if he didn't, even if he believed the election was stolen, even if he sincerely believed the big lie, that doesn't provide cover for all of the other little lies, and the lies are all the way down. So Jack Smith's team continues to impress. Yes, they are doing uh, – so one other reason to, to distinguish between the Mueller team and the Smith team. The Mueller team, of course, never ended up in litigation with Trump, right? right? And so uh, you're sort of comparing the, the pre – uh, or, or non-indictment right. language of a report right. with the advocacy Fair. language of a brief. But, uh, and Trump so, was president. Look, he could have fired them at any moment, too. That's exactly. the other thing, right? I mean, there's a right. big difference there, you know. But you're also definitely right that Mueller is very old school. Um, you know, how many interviews has Mueller given since he left office? None. Um, you know, there's a there's a very old school you know, pardon me, WASP, uh, elite, uh, you know, Rob, this is the Robert Swan Muller, right? Where you do your job, you do your duty, and then you disappear and you comment in court. And, and it you, speaks you know, for that, itself, right? Yes. It really <laughs> speaks for itself. Um, you know, Jack Smith, uh, again, it's a different environment. He's actually in criminal litigation against the guy. But they are defending every step as they go. They are writing briefs that are with a real awareness that every single one of them is going to be read by the press and talked about in environments like this. Um, uh, and Trump is, uh, I think, in the 
uh, impressive vernacular of Steve Bannon is throwing a huge, trying to flood the zone with shit. Mm -hmm. And so you have a, um, you know, a 79 page brief that is responding. uh, First of all, it has two jobs really here. One is to uh, respond to the motions uh, which are a series of motions to dismiss on on various statutory and right. and and constitutional grounds, uh, some of which arguments are frankly ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Um, and but you know to create a clear record for Tanya Chutkin to rule mm-hmm. on those motions. But the other is to signal to the public this is flooding the zone with shit, and we're not putting right. up with it. And, and maybe um, that's the key it, is that he understands that he's got multiple audience that it's that it is the judge, but it's also there. There is the public, and they're watching it, and and they're creating the historical record. And they're well, and they're creating a record for the for for the D.C. Circuit mm-hmm. and ultimately the Supreme Court. And there are there are a whole lot of issues here. Um, one of which has its own motion, which is the most important one: the the uh, the presidential immunity issue. That may go to the Supreme Court. There's nothing else here that is substantially colorable. There are some inter- there are some interesting uh, uh, obstruction questions under under uh, 1512, um, but there's m- most of this is just noise. And being able to say to to the courts, "Hey, winnow this out." deal with the stuff that could be subject to immediate appeal, particularly yeah. the immunity stuff first. Um, and the rest just, you know, signal to the public, we are really unworried about this. The evidence is overpowering yeah. and create a path uh, for the courts to get rid of a lot of it. And that, I think they're doing a very good job with that. Okay, let me just get, read, read a couple of things here. This is was, was filed on Monday, and it you know urges Judge Shutkin to sweep aside all of Trump's efforts to sanitize his conduct. Uh, this was written by Assistant Special Counsel James Pierce. He wrote, The defendant attempts to rewrite the indictment, claiming that it charges him with wholly innocuous, perhaps even admirable conduct, sharing his opinions about election fraud and seeking election integrity, when in fact, it clearly describes the defendant's fraudulent use of knowingly false statements as weapons in furtherance of his criminal plan. And it lays out, um, you know, all of, you know, the fact that, you know, the, the indictment is full of Trump's claims of election fraud as knowing lies. So that, you know, with it, it's not just whether the election was stolen, but the specific lies that it goes through. Uh, prosecutors are now also, it's interesting, they're also signaling they're paying attention to what he's doing in real time. Uh, Prosecutors will use his pardon promises. They will use his decision to record the Star Spangled Banner with the the January 6th inmates and the false slates of presidential uh, electors as as evidence. Uh, Here's uh, more from Pierce. The defendant stands alone in American history for his alleged crimes. No other president has engaged in conspiracy and construction to overturn valid election results and illegitimately retain power. See, that's what I've, I found so powerful about how clear this is and brushing aside the everyone does it. I was just expressing my opinion. And as a non-lawyer, I, I thought it was very interesting. The analogy they used saying, you know, if there's a business executive who subjectively believes that his company is going to succeed, Right, believes that his company is 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 going to be profitable. That does not give him license, him or her license, then to engage in fraud and to and to use knowingly false statements out there, even though their intent may be based on on their subjective belief. So they they explain it in ways that I think that the American public can understand if the American public is paying any attention. Right. So there's a there's a. Trump's strategic objective, or rather Trump's lawyer's Mm. strategic objective in these briefs is to zoom out to a level of altitude where you can say, well, he was just giving a speech. He was just, you know, and presidents give speeches all the time. time, Or he was just uh, calling state officials to express his opinion. And presidents do that all the time. Right. And, um, you know, and so the the 
the oh, oh, and no specific words that he said constitute an incitement right. within the meaning of incitement law. Um, uh, and the job of the prosecutor is always here to remind, I'm going to put it in a different, in a bit different language, that the same words can be criminal or First Amendment protected entirely depending on context. Which so if I true, say yeah. to you, yeah. Charlie, that's a nice house, it would be mm -hmm. a shame if something happened to it. If I'm Don Corleone, that is a, a threat, right? A true threat. If I'm an insurance salesman trying to send you, uh, sell you a policy, an insurance policy, that's a perfectly valid and constitutionally protected, right. right? If I say to you, Charlie, I have a bridge to sell you, um, uh, please transfer the entire uh, contents of your bank account to mine, um, uh, and I am trying to defraud you of your uh, um, account, uh, of your money, that is a crime. Um, we're in different states, so we're, we're communicating by wire here. That would be classic wire fraud. On the other hand, if I'm a comedian, um, you know, saying, well, if you believe that, transfer me all your money, I've got a bridge to sell you. You know, it might not be a good joke, but it's clearly constitutionally protected. Yeah. And so, to, to, you know, the job of the prosecutors here is constantly Context. to keep the courts and the public focused on the meaning and purpose of what he was trying to do and the voluminous evidence of that, so, uh, rather than on what are the specific words that he spoke and have other presidents said something like that at right, some vaguely, other time vaguely. in some no, no, other that's, context? That, that, that's important to keep in mind. Again, so speaking of the, the, so the nesting doll of, of lies, I really liked, for example, the way they just sort of went through it and say, you know, wh whatever you believe about whether the election was rigged, it doesn't change the fact that these statements and they list them, you know, one after another are completely uh, our lies. And no, and Timothy knew they McVeigh, were. So, so, Timothy yeah. McVeigh earnestly believed yep. that, uh, you know, the federal government had murdered innocent women and children at Waco and it yep. was all because of the Jews yep. and the that the people that doesn't mean right. it's not murder no. when you blow up a federal building. So lo look at these these things. There's like five or six of them. Um, the claim that 36,000 non-citizens had voted in Arizona. Donald Trump said it, not, not, it's a total lie, that more than 10,300 dead people had voted in Georgia, total lie, uh, that there had been an illicit dump of more than 100,000 ballots in Detroit, totally false, that there had been 205,000 more votes than voters in Pennsylvania. Now, by the way, the, the prosecutor has, and the January 6th committee has, has specific tape and testimony of people who say, you know, this came up and I told him this was not true. Bill Barr, his own attorney general, told him this was not true about Pennsylvania, for example, in Georgia, um, that there had been tens of thousands of unlawful votes in Wisconsin. No evidence whatsoever that voting machines in various contested states had switched votes from the defendant to Biden. This is the Dominion lawsuit, which to say that there's a lot of evidence showing that all of those allegations about Dominion were bullshit. It has been pretty well established and it cost Fox News $787 million. So, you know, this is what they're honing into is that, you know, he, Trump wants to litigate whether his you know, belief about uh, the the overall election is somehow constitutionally protected free speech, as you point out. But that does not provide cover for these very clearly palpable uh, and provably false statements that he made in, as part of his effort to overturn the election. Exactly. Okay. So, uh, Ben, um, one, one last comment before I ask you the most important question of the day. Um, Eileen Cannon uh, down in Florida uh, ruled today that she's not delaying the trial, but she's going to be hearing motions in March. Um, give me your sense of what she is doing, because she seems to be dragging her feet. And then I, I, I think a lot of the observers are just sort of assuming that Eileen Cannon is just going to punt this thing after the election as Trump wants. What do you think? So, I, like, I think there's a huge amount of reason to be suspicious of mm -hmm. Eileen Cannon. She is not, uh, uh, well, in, on one very public issue, she was not a straight shooter. Um, and she's, uh, I think there are a lot of reasons to be suspicious of her 
uh, handling of this case so far. That said, I think this decision is the right decision, um, which is to say, um, if the DC case is really going to trial on March 5th, which uh, Judge Chutkin wants it to, the government really wants it to, and it seems on track to do, then it is implausible that the that she can actually hold the trial in May in Florida, um, because the the trial in Washington is going to take some serious time, and so the uh, I think keeping keeping the date on the books for now and saying, look, we're going to try to be prepared to go to trial. Uh, I believe it's May 25th. I forget what the mm -hmm. exact date, but sometime in May, we're going to try to be prepared to, to do that. Um, but we're going to hear motions at the time of, you know, to delay if, a, you know, if that's appropriate uh, uh, in connection, we're going to keep our eye on Washington. I think that's sort of the only thing she can do here. The problem that we're going to have with Eileen Cannon is that she is really dragging her feet on the classified information litigation. And so uh, so there's a huge amount of classified discovery in this case, and she is not moving with alacrity to resolve classification issues. And that's, uh, that's going to end up forcing her if she doesn't speed up and, and, you know, get a fire lit under her butt, that's going to force her at the end of the day to, uh, to postpone the case, which, you know, may be what she wants anyway. So I think, uh, I think this was a pretty reasonable disposition of this issue, but I'm For still now. very suspicious of the way she's handling the matter. I, I, I think that sounds about right. Okay, so trigger warning for those of you that just want to obsess about Trump's trials, you, you, can, you can move on now because we're going to move on to... Well, we're going to flood the zone with... We are going to flood the zone with... We really are. <laughs> um, and, um, you, you know, for people who know that Ben has a daily newsletter, the Dog Shirt Daily, um, which this week was changed to the dog shit daily because there was an incident and there's an issue involving the disposal of, shall we say, dog waste in the District of Columbia. What is neighborly? What is not neighborly? So, Mr. Witters, we, we need to have a poll. I know you're running a poll. We'll get to the poll results later. Um, who do you agree with? Uh, ben Wittes, his neighborhood Karen, the throwing woman. So, Ben... Tell me All right, story. I'll tell you what happened. Brief tell me, yeah. tell me what happened in your own words, Ben. Yeah, so what happened was uh, I unknowingly violated uh, D.C. city ordinance. I have always thought that- No, 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 we don't no, get to the ordinance. I just want to know what happened. The, tell me All the right. facts. I, Let's, I want to I was to the taking, facts, Mr. Wittes. I was taking my dogs for a walk. Okay. Uh, uh, one of them uh, uh, did his business in an alley defecated. where uh, we often walk. Canine defecation. Yes. An act Number of canine two. defecation. Okay, okay. And um, we, um, I picked it up, and I deposited you, the bag. In, in what? Of, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Wittes. In be more in specific. A, in, yeah. in a poop bag. A poop as bag. Green poop bag. Yeah. Okay. Green poop bag. Tied. And top. I tied it off, okay. Okay. and I put it in a trash barrel that I was walking by. You know, in D.C., a lot of. Uh, Alleys have, you know, there where people have their trash barrels where the where the guard, uh, the trash truck comes, and so I put it in and I went off uh, listening to Yasha Monk's uh, new book as I walked with my dogs, and a woman uh, came charging. It is is, is out your of claim, by the way, that you were distracted by Yasha Monk's book? When, when well, I, I, look, I no, 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 no. I do that. I do that every day. No, no. My defense is simply Blaming that Yasha I, Monk. Okay. I mean, most things are Yasha Monk's fault, well, but, I know. um, but, but, um, no, Yasha it was really more the, the relevance of Yasha Monk's book was really that I didn't notice that this, I was aware that a woman was shouting. I didn't really notice that she was shouting at me because I was listening to Yasha talk about Foucault. And, okay. um, and so I was like thinking about Yasha and Foucault and you woman know, is yelling at you about dog while you are listening a, to a a, to, a discussion of Foucault. OK, exactly. And so all of a, a sudden moment. it penetrates my head that she's yelling at me because I hear her yell other people's garbage. And I turn around over my left shoulder and there's this woman halfway down the block with a 
poop bag of dog sh that Your she's apparently fi- well I assume so okay that she's fished out of I think oh, no. her trash barrel which I had put it in and she hurls it at me and um she you know she doesn't have the bag of dog sh- at you yes dogs that were did when I say, say flood the did zone she say words sh- that sounded I mean like Foucault with- no, I mean, she it, said. She said, "Take it to the park and dispose of it in a public barrel." And uh, she throws it at me, and then storms off back into her yard. And I am left, uh, you know, with like half a block between us and a bag of dog sh- in between, thinking, "Well, first of all, all of these these." Um, Garbage uh, cans are kind of public property. They're the mm. city's garbage cans. So this cans, is the legal, which the, legal que- the legal question is, did you have, under D.C. law, the right to place this dog so bag the, in her? The answer is... The- the answer is no. Oh. I, 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 la- I later looked it up under... in, in, in on D.C. law is on her side. The D.C. government calls my conduct illegal and unneighborly. It even makes a moral judgment about it. So I, I stand condemned in the eyes of, of, of the D.C. government. And yet I sort of uh, think the Karen was more the asshole here than I was. Um, uh, I was, after all, throwing trash in a trash can, and she was throwing dog shit at a stranger. But okay, I acknowledge I was in the wrong legally. And um, uh, I came back and so I the wrote law, it up. The, the law sides with the woman hurling at you. Yeah, okay, well, right. at least on, as to my conduct. Okay, I don't okay, know right, if the right. world, the law has uh, has anything to say about throwing dog shit at people. I think that may be an assault. Um, so I put up a poll on dog yeah. shirt daily right. under the headline dog shit daily yep. who's the asshole in this story mm-hmm. and i want to just uh, announce the results I'm sorry, no, what are the cho- what are the choices before we so wittis is the asshole the karen is the asshole the karen is mostly the asshole wittis is mostly the asshole both are equally assholes are your options okay so the results the first well the results do you want the results in the the, the form most favorable to wittis or least favorable to wittis Let's well, you choose. All right, it, I'm going to do it's, both. It's it's your gonna, poll. I'll do both. Okay. So, in if you are friendly to Wittis, you will notice in this poll. This poll is like a Rorschach test. Yes. Um, only eight percent said I was the asshole. Okay, good. Uh, as opposed, now these are to your 20, readers, right? These are your people. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so granted, it's a little bit it is, skewed, it is right? Not a random <laughs> sample. Yeah, these are people 20%. that actually subscribe to your newsletter who read you Correct. every day. Okay, so I don't think that the in Karen context, wrote it up in her newsletter, but yeah. just yeah, the Karen is the asshole. Got twenty percent. Okay, so I beat Ooh. her by twelve percent. Right. Okay. So on the mostly the asshole, I got twelve percent, and the Karen got thirty five percent, and the equal holes were 25 percent so it's really quite a bell curvy spread yeah so but here's the bad news for you Mm -hmm. if if you're friendly to witness so this is my as you point out a readership that can be expected to be disproportionately friendly to witness and if you sum up the i am the asshole the witness is the asshole the witness is mostly the asshole that's 20 percent and the both are equally the assholes, that's 25%. So if you sum up the group that says we are, I am at least as much to fault as the Karen, that is 45%, which is suspiciously like Joe Biden's approval numbers, I just (laughs) want to point out. Um, And so a huge percentage of the audience, 45% thinks of my audience, thinks I'm at least... uh, um, I th- as much of I am call. thinking so, that a large portion of those people are not dog owners or do not walk dogs because this, this seems is, very harsh. It seems very du- judgmental uh, from folks that do not understand the difficulty of dealing with dogs and dealing with those green poop bags. I mean, if you've actually you know, dealt with the green poop bags, I think you're going to be a little bit more, a little kinder and gentler 
in your analysis and your behavior? I, to me, it's not even like, I understand that people have uh, uh, strong feelings about this. And now that I know that DC law is on the Karen side, I will Mm -hmm. carry the, I starting yesterday have been carrying uh, the poop bags to my can or to some public can fine, whatever. It's not the biggest problem in the world. Uh, I got to say, getting mad at people for throwing garbage in garbage cans uh, because it's not like, you know, some of the ones in our neighborhood smell great um, and some smell bad. I, it just it, it strikes me as a ridiculous thing to get upset about. And however upset you are, throwing dog at your neighbors seems like an overreaction to me. But I accept that 45 percent of my readers hold me at least 50 percent accountable for this. And I will only just say Something my revenge about. against that 45% will be swift and terrible. And we will all await it. Ben? We're going we're gonna to assign the Justice Department to it. I'm going to run for retribution. president so that I can, ass- I am your retribution. Ben, thank you for the analysis and for the sharing. I appreciate it very we much. We will be back next week with, <laughs> with or without dog and we will do this all over and if again. And if there's any fallout, if you ever run into the Karen again, you know, make, make sure make sure you let us know, will you, please? Oh, a- I'm gonna. I, I'm. I'm never, never walking by her house without a camera again. I am. I am. I am thinking it, that. I wonder if Karen, if, if Karen has a newsletter and whether she put up an online poll on this, what the results would be. I suspect she does not and did not <laughs> because I got to say if, as. As humbled as I am to find out that my activity is illegal and unneighborly, according to my government, um, I suspect if she had to describe her behavior, she would be more embarrassed than I. Yeah. See, I'm just guessing that given your neighborhood and stuff that, you know, it's possible she'll turn out to be like an assistant secretary of state or something like that. Right. It is possible. Like, keep, 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 this could have been a federal judge. You just never know. Ben, <laughs> thank, thanks so much. Thank every, everybody for listening to this weekend's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We will be back on Monday and we'll do something like this all over again.